top of my head what I wanted what I wanted to speak about. But um, when I actually put together the um, uh, uh, PowerPoint, I, I decided to go in another direction. So I hope that's right. Uh, the word here, Mina. I, I've, I've silenced everybody on my screen, but what does MENA stand for as the new HIP acronym? Call it out if you know. Nobody? It sounds for Middle East and North African, which is how people who I would call Sfaradim and Eidot HaMizrach like to call themselves these days, or at least some young people. I can't generalize about anybody with this fractious uh, population. Because after all, when we say Sfaradim, we say, oh, the Persians in LA are Sfaradim. No, they're not. They never went to Sfarad. They never went to Spain. <laughs> they have no connection to this. So why do we call people who are Eidot HaMizrach from the Middle East Sfaradim? It's already, it's already improper, and I'll get to that in a second. Now, look, um, we have some strange things in the Zionism we were taught. Uh, People in Camp Tell You Who to tried their best to be fair and open. Um, Mel Reesfield, in fact, had a particular sensitivity to Ashka normativity, and he didn't like the privileging of shtetl life and that kind of thing over um, the Sephardi and Eidot HaMizrach experience. He spoke out against it a number of times in the doings of the Merak Zim. On the other hand, uh, Ashkenazim did make up three quarters of the Jewish world as of 1848, and that's a long time, so I don't feel too bad about it. Um, but we all, all think about Kibbutz Galuyot, we all understand the problems of the Ma'abarot uh, and the um, Par Ha'adati. My own students at Beit Sefer Nisui and Machane Yehuda blamed the Par Ha'adati on uh, German reparations, and that was the way that they sort of lived with it, in, you know, in their own rather diverse uh, um, uh, classroom. Um, this is the Ezor Atasiyav Talpiot, way back when, okay, uh, in, in the early 1960s, I think. So, um, uh, but we all know about this, and it really sort of reached its nadir in a, in a, in a, a vehicle that became sort of canon uh, in mid-century American, you know, suburban Zionism, uh, uh, Salah Shabbati, which was rife with horrific um, stereotypes about various uh, Eidot who had been, after all, uprooted from their real context, uh, had their, their dignity and their lives stripped away from them, and were arguably more modern in their original context in the first uh, uh, part of the century. Um, uh, more modern than uh, some Ashkenazi Jews in the you know former Pale of Settlement, so it's not right. But I don't want to go there. I, I decided like to choose life and talk about something that I was um, that I am expert in. So rather than 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 think about that, we have plenty of time to think about that, and we have plenty of time to think about the the problem of Ashkenazi normativity and the patronizing issues in the scholarly world that stay between Adot, and I'll refer to them. But let's go to a holy place. Let's talk about beautiful things. Let's talk about Kabbalah. And to contextualize ourselves, we have to understand what, um, uh, what Kabbalah consists of in its rawest form. So the idea of Kabbalah is that God emanates into the world through 10 stages which are also 10 psychological qualities. They can be implemented like a kind of Jewish chakra practice for those of you who are um, you know, uh, familiar with Eastern uh, spiritual practices. But in theory, there are 10 stages in the emanation of God into the world. This understanding complicated around midway through the development of it in the canonical text, the Zohar, and the, the process of emanation didn't go through one set of 10 stops, but it went through uh, four sets of 10 stops on the way from the apex of the Godhead, uh, as they say in the movie, Hail Caesar, to uh, our present reality. And then there was another understanding here, I'm printing it from a theosophical text of, uh, so there may be some Christological elements in this, in which uh, the spherotic tree is portrayed as a kind of a divine family. 
And the divine family is a mother, a father, uh, a child, an elder who has a, a complex relationship to everything, and the child's consort. And the child who's here sort of like depicted as a kind of Christ-like figure is, um, is the center of it. It was this system that the young Ashkenazi Kabbalists in 16th century Cairo fascinate, fastened upon in his own understanding of Kabbalah, and um, uh, as a result of which he, because he in fact had come from a sundered family himself. He came from a family in which his father had died and his mother had had to go down to Cairo from Yerushalayim. And she apparently had an obscure relationship with her uncle uh, whose daughter uh, Isaac Luria married. So when he saw this, this sundered family, he, got, um, he, he really saw himself in that. And that became the basis of the Lurianic system, which um, uh, spread throughout the world. Now, the, the, this last doctrine in the original book, the Zohar, is supposedly preached by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai uh, just before he's immolated at, at the foot of Mount Meron in the Galil. And so that, 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 those texts became the most important texts of the Zohar for Kabbalists to study. And that doctrine of the sundered family, if you go into the Kabbalah Center and decide to order the complete works of Isaac Luria, and I hope you do, um, they will tell you, uh, they, they, they will, um, there's 20 volumes, and they largely deal with the dynamics of that sundered family, very little with the, um, the tikkun, what we know, the tzimtzum, God's withdrawal from the world, the uh, breaking of the vessels, the famous shvirat uh, kelim, and uh, the need for tikkun, and tikkun olam, which is a really misunderstood topic halachically, but uh, let's not go there. Anyway, uh, this is this place where Rabbi Shimon's uh, students immolated themselves. It's on Ein Zeitun, uh, a fork in the road between Meron and Svat, um, great place to go, burial cave. Um, now the breaking of the vessels is very misunderstood. I can't help but go there for a second. This is Anselm Kiefer's, Kiefer's breaking of the vessels in which the vessels are, are treated as a spherotic tree made out of lead and concrete, therefore being a kind of uh, a strong Holocaust reference, including the, um, the broken glass in front, a reference to Kristallnacht, but that's not actually how the vessels broke. Uh, here are the, the four worlds and they moved in and out of each, each other and they sort of buckled like a broken car antenna in a very crude car with an AM radio. I often do a dramatic portrayal of this for my students, emphasizing the economic differences between the faculty teaching them and themselves. So uh, that's really how the breaking of the vessels worked. It didn't work in that sort of dramatic way that Anselm Kiefer uh, saw it. It wasn't glass splayed all over the place, but an internal buckling. I just had to throw that in. Okay, there's Rabbi Shimon again. Um, when we used to walk on the year course, uh, we used to walk before the intifadas, think about it, from Beit El to I, and Joel Duman always used to um, stop uh, and show the spot between Beit El and I where Avram Avinu probably stopped, and there was nothing there. Now I see that they built the crude structure there to commemorate the place where Avram Avinu stopped, but that's not the Beit El we're talking about now. We're talking about, we're gonna fast forward to the 18th century, and the Beit El Yeshiva of Jerusalem, here lovingly restored in the old city of Jerusalem. That was the first gathering place of uh, capitalists uh, formally in the 18th century. And it was to there that the first seminal figure in Eidot HaMizrach Kabbalah uh, fled to. His name was Shalom Sharabi. He was a gifted student from Sharab, actually from Sana in Yemen, and he um, fled from Yemen after a, an incident that they they describe as Kamaase Eshet Potiphar, something like the matter of the wife of Potiphar in the Joseph story. Uh, usually, the accounts have much more graphic detail in them, with him, you know, tying his uh, kafia around uh, the pole of an upstairs bathroom and slithering away. From there, he's 
he escaped to um, uh, Iraq, to Basra, and then from there to Lebanon. And from there, he came to Yerushalayim, uh, where the striking young man, like Hillel, slept on the roof of the snowy, on the snowy nights in Jerusalem and came down. And when people used to leave questions written out in their copies of the Lurianic works, uh, he would answer them until they found out that it was the young Yemeni who's been sleeping on the roof and working as the janitor who, you know, uh, was answering our questions and he became, rose to prominence and married the Rosh Yeshiva's beautiful daughter, end of story. In 1948, of course, Beit El was destroyed and it relocated for a while to Geula where it was managed by the Hadaya family, uh, a scion of whom was also the, um, uh, the chief rabbi of Eilat uh, during the period of uh, uh, people getting married in the 1970s on Kibbutz Kitora. Anyway, Sharabi had a system which really sort of reduced all of Kabbalistic thought to a kind of MS-DOS language. When I talk about this in rabbinical school, they think I'm saying emet dot. Like, but I'm think, thinking of you know, Microsoft, you know, whatever it was, DOS language, uh, in, 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 in which all the ideas of the Kabbalah, here's an old stamp of Beit El, were reduced to a kind of a code in which every time you say, said God's name, you had to think. If you look at the upper, uh, the upper part here, um, you had to think about God's name and vocalize it in your mind with different vocalizations. So when you said here, uh, when you came to God's name, you had to think of it with a chirik here, and then with a, a, a vav there, uh, like a shuruk. Uh, shuruk is actually three dots like this on the left. You had to run through it in your mind and let your mind vibrate with the vibration of the different vocalizations, even as nothing came out of your mouth. And you did that with every blessing in the Siddur. Every blessing in the Siddur. Here's another one. The, these are the meditations on the word atah. When you say Baruch atah Hashem, and I'm not even sure um, where this comes from. So he had reduced the dynamics of Kabbalah to the very letters themselves and the very vocalizations. And when I went looking for this about 15 years ago, and I wrote the first uh, monograph, the first English monograph on this kind of Kabbalah, um, I, uh, uh, I, I thought I was looking for the great lost Jewish mantra practice. It didn't work out that way. And there were other things that I young Mina activist would identify in my impulse as a, like, what, what um, uh, you know, a contemporary anti-racist call the white savior complex. Well, perhaps I had that. But um, uh, in any case, this cumbersome method became the standard Kabbalah of Jerusalem in the 18th century with some, um, with some, uh, uh, changes, okay, with, 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 with some exceptions to that rule, okay? Um, and here is another Sharabi sitter in manuscript. So Sharabi with his meditative kind of, um, his meditative kind of prayer, which when I encountered these Kabbalists in Jerusalem, they prayed the morning service for three hours, starting at 4.30 in the morning. And they had already been up at midnight reciting the prayers over the destruction of the temple, after which they went back to sleep. They had a bit of study in, in the midday. They usually crash from a kind of hypoglycemic collapse in the afternoon, and then started all again in the evening with another three hour prayer service. As a result of this, they were pretty much in a trance state all the time. Uh, I hesitate to say it, perhaps like participants in what we might call a cult. Okay. Here's another figure. There are no pictures of Sharabi, but we have pictures of this handsome man. This is Rav Yosef Chaim, the Ben Ish Chai. The Ben Ish Chai was the chief rabbi of Baghdad. He was a brilliant writer. Um, he uh, named each of his books after the line uh, about Ben Yaho Ben Yehoyada, general of uh, King David's, 
uh, that he was a, the son of a, a the son of a living man. He was the Ben Chai that he slew the lion on a slew the bear on a snowy day. There are wonderful things that they say about him. Yosef Chaim had a religious experience at the grave of uh, uh, Pinchas Ben Yair. Uh, uh, well, this is Pinchas ben Yair, but he had an ex experience at the grave of ben Yahu ben Yehoyada. This is at the bottom of Tzfat, near the, um, at the bottom of the old grave, grave site in Tzfat. And that was ben Yahu ben Yehoyada's um, grave, and he had a religious experience there, so he uh, named all of his books after that, uh, after him. Um, uh, the ben Chai is studied in every Eidot HaMizrach synagogue, I'm willing to bet, um, from LA to Yerushalayim and points in between. He's extremely widespread because he's a brilliant writer um, uh, and very, very erudite in Jewish sources. But he did not have an entry in the Encyclopedia Judaica in the first volume from 1972, the first version. And when I met the editor of the new edition, I said, please um, put in an entry on the Ben Ishchai. There's only uh, an, an entry on his family, all right, his general family, but not about, about him. And, and the editor said, well, I'll speak to the people who are editing the Kabbalah out of the Israeli Kabbalah establishment, and we'll definitely put it in. But they didn't. Okay, he flew under the radar. And in fact, one of the things that impelled me to write my uh, uh, book about Sharabi was the average Kabbalah student at the Hebrew University was lost upon going into a bookstore in Machane Yehuda. Okay. Because uh, just nobody knows the, uh, 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 there was just, their antennae were turned off to Sephardic and Edot HaMizrach Kabbalah. Um, another figure coming from Morocco, Rav Chaim Ibn Attar, um, the Or HaChaim, wrote a commentary on the Torah. It was to his Beit Midrash that the brother-in-law of the Baal Shem Tov, Rav Gershom Kitover, uh, wanted to go in um, uh, when he made Aliyah during the, the life of the Baal Shem Tov. One of the only writings we have of the Baal Shem Tov uh, is um, uh, his letter to Rav Gershom Kittifer describing how he went to heaven and talked to Mashiach and that kind of thing. Uh, this is the, ben, the um, Or HaChaim's Beit Midrash. It has been restored in what we now call the Old Yishuv Court Museum in the Old City, okay? Um, here's his signature, another example of his signature. Another figure from the period is the Chidar of Chaim Yosef David Azilai. In his lifetime, he became a well-known emissary collecting funds for Yerushalayim in the late 19th century. And he was a wonderful popular writer, again, of a, of a, a Moroccan background. Other Moroccan gedolim include Rav Chaim Pinto uh, and the Abu Chatseira family, uh, culminating, as you see on the right, with the Baba Sali, um, who, whose, uh, works, whose wonder works you must have heard of in, in your sojourns uh, in Israel back when the year course was having a period uh, on Moshav and, and development town and that kind of thing. Um, the Kabbalah of North Africa is different from the Kabbalah of the Middle East. The Kabbalah of North Africa is based on the Zohar. They tend to have a strong tradition that the Zohar came from the land of Israel to a little town in the Atlas Mountains called Dra, where parts of it were lost. And so they are the true masters of the Zohar. At the same time, um, they uh, it was Middle Eastern Kabbalists who um, uh, controlled the role of the um, Chacham Bashi or Rishon Litzion under the Ottomans. The Ottomans seldom appointed a, 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 a uh, a non, uh, a non, Eidot Mizrach figure. They seldom appointed a, uh, a North African. They didn't trust them in the same way. So it was uh, it was a mafia uh, made up of Eidot Mizrach. Rechaim uh, Cheski Medini in Yerushalayim to Hebron, but he really spent about forty years in Crimea, and he was the Rav of Crimea. Uh, uh, we know him as the Stay Chemed. He died in Hebron. 
uh, just a beautiful man. Uh, my, my point being he spent 40 years in Crimea because bear in mind that the lines between Sephardi and Ashkenazi were very, very blurred in many respects because places like the Baal Shem Tov's very birthplace, Medzibis, in Podolia, in, Pol in, in the Ukraine, was under Ottoman rule in the year that he was born. The Ottoman Empire was much bigger than we really imagine and had much more, much more overlap. So the Baal Shem Tov himself, according to Moshe Idel, a great Kabbalah scholar, uh, probably studied with Sufi masters in, in, in Turkey. In any case, here's the Stey Chemet. He, he composed an eight volume impenetrable co uh, collection of Halakha and Kabbalah called the Stey Chemet and uh, uh, the, the lovely, the gracious field. And um, uh, you, 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 you need an index to get around it. Um, Yudha Pattaya, uh, father of a number of, grandfather of a number of important figures, important Sephardic rabbi in these, this day and age, Rav Chaim Ovadia, um, Chaviva Padaya of uh, the Kabbalah department of the um, Ben-Gurion University, and Rose Pattaya, a cabinet maker in Montreal. Um, Yudha Pattaya was the last person to exercise a dibbuk. That was in 1937 in Baghdad. Uh, he came to Yerushalayim shortly after, um, and a dibbuk was not exercised of re on record until around 1983. In 1983, the dibbuk sounded a lot like Linda Blair in the Exodus, and they used much more psychological methods than you see in the movie, The Dibbuk. Okay, this is a picture of Durer's melancholy. I don't know where I put it in. Um, yeah, so that, th there you have it. Um, the capitalistic communities of Yerushalayim are to a great extent prop, uh, the structural glory of old Yerushalayim. The depths of their theology is, is um, uh, very profound, yet has been largely neglected in the academic community. Um, it's good for me because I wrote a book and now everybody cites me. Uh, what's the name of the game in academia after all? But, um, but having a, a sensibility to this is something we should have more in mind. And I regret that I didn't educate my students at Beit Sefer and Usui in Yerushalayim on this more. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop the share and ask if we have any questions or anything. Do we have any, anybody have anything to ask or say? Great presentation. At the beginning, That's I thought I knew that I knew it from what you taught me at Tel Yehuda, but when you went along, I realized there's a lot more to say. No, no, no. It's all it's all very new stuff. And you know, here's the reality: if you live in America, um, you have a Jewish establishment. It's very much like you had in the mid 20th century, and you've got all these new populations. You've got Syrians on the northeastern seaboard, and you've got Moroccans in Quebec, and you've got uh, Persians, Iranians in LA, and you've got Russians everywhere, uh, and you've got uh, expatriate Israelis, and they're all completely alienated. The only people who are across the board providing services for them are Chabad, um, you know, and, and the Jewish communities, uh, the Jewish establishment's uh, attitude says, well, why don't you just join our conservative temples and become an upper middle class Seinfeld character? And that's not the case. They're living Bukharim in Queens, middle class in, uh, uh, middle class in name, middle class, you know, on paper, but they're living paycheck to paycheck as contractors and that kind of thing and going to rough high schools and so on and so forth. And the only services they have are Chabad, and they have birthright, you know, and birthright, you know, is pretty efficient for all of its, you know, conceptual failings. So, well, I do have a question, which is yes, how, how did you get started on this path of learning about the Sephardic and Dodo Mizrach world of Allah? When I made Aliyah, I lived in the Bukharian quarter and I looked around me and I, I, I saw that there was really all of this culture that was really undocumented. So for a long time, as I said, I had a kind of a white savior complex about it that I was going to write the first thing. And then, um, but I did, you know, the young Israeli scholars are very appreciative of my work and I like, I'm, that's very gratifying to me. Um, 
But then, you know, I, I then I went to Poland and I realized, hell, I'm I'm Ashkenazi is gefilte fish. I better live that life. So I stopped, you know, cosplaying in that regard. But you know, um, uh, honoring the Masora is step number one in healing the rifts. So that's what I tried to that's what I tried to do here. I mean, I've 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 seen some shocking things in academia. Um, you know, Ebrut Said coined the term Orientalism uh, to describe uh, the relationship to the Palestinians. Um, and Israeli scholars have co-opted it to talk about uh, Ashkenazi relationships to, you know, uh, to uh, Sephardic and Eidot HaMizrach culture, which really extends, unfortunately, to some, some uh, big scholars get tarred with that brush. So it's, it's, a, it's a thing. But the major scholar of this in uh, uh, Israel, Jonathan Meir, said I was meticulous. It's really the nicest thing that anybody's ever said about me, including the most inaccurate. So I, I've always said you're meticulous. Sir. Oh, thank you. Well, I, 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 see, I can trust I, you. Yeah, Kenny. I have a question. So it, I may be wrong, but it seems to me that on the Ashkenazic side, the whole mystical tradition really got, you know, um, sort of subsumed into Hasidut. Right. I mean, like, yes, they, 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 they are really the champions of this. Uh, and, and so my question is, and, and, and again, I'm going back to this, to what we call the Sephardic side, which are probably uh, the Edot of They really didn't have Hasidut as a tradition. Right. I mean, like, unless I'm wrong about this. Right. They, they didn't have the same kind of Hasidic, you know, um, ideas that we had in Eastern Europe. Right. I mean, so my question is, if that's true. How do the two mix together, like in today's world? Like, you know, how does Hasidut and these this myst mystic tradition from the Eidot or do or do they mix? You know, well, you know? we have to understand in this world, which is not the world we grew up in, we have something that they call in Israel Habakuk, right. which is Chabad, Breslov, and followers of Rav Kook. So there's a tishtush, there's a porousness in the middle, often at the kind of sort of Grateful Dead freak level. Do you know what I mean? It's a kind of a situation anybody can join, if you know what I mean, if you go far enough out in the West Bank or, you know, deeper in, enough into, you know, Ramat Beit Shemesh, you know, you, you'll always have something to do. I mean, it's a little bit marginal in that regard, but I think there's a definite issue. Rav Nachman of Breslau said that davening like Sharabi was like witchcraft. You're supposed mm -hmm. to, to, to learn it, but not do it. 150 years later, I heard a brass lover say to another, my rabbi is greater than yours because he can, he can, he does daf yomi and he does all the prayers of Sharabi. And this was in the brass love context. So things have morphed, things have morphed, religion is morphed, you know. Rabbi uh, Giller, I'm just going to hop in uh, really yeah, quickly. Go. Got another minute or two if you want to take right. any well, listen, last question comments. All right, well, it's wonderful to see you all. I'm looking around, I'm seeing people that I just love to have a long, warm conversation with and some people who I owe. Uh, you know, I owe a lot to they who know who, who they are. Okay. I haven't seen them recently. Okay. So I hope to be in touch with everybody. Okay. Thank you so much, Rabbi Giller. Um, everyone who is here. Thank you so